The Tom Woods Show, episode 957. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, check out the titles of these intriguing books. 14 Hard Questions for Libertarians Answered. Education Without the State. Your Facebook friends are wrong about health care. And Bernie Sanders is wrong. What do these books have in common? They're all free at tomsfreebooks.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Frederick Bastiat is our topic of discussion today. He was, of course, one of the great French classical liberals of the 19th century. A great many of you, no doubt, have read at least some of his work. He is tremendous, a wonderful writer, masterful thinker. But it turns out he also had an, a very eventful life. He was a multifaceted person. He's a very interesting guy to learn about, and we're going to talk about him today. You might want to listen to this episode in tandem with episode 469, all the way back there, where I spent some time talking about the content of Bastiat's thought. And of course, we're going to do some of that today, but that, this is a companion episode, I suppose, to that. And I'm really glad to be joined today in this task by David Hart, who is a historian and the online library director at Liberty Fund and academic editor of the collected works of Frederick Bastiat. He holds a PhD from King's College, Cambridge, and I'm very glad to welcome him to the show now. David, thanks for being here. Thanks, Tom, for inviting me. I think almost everybody loves Frederick Bastiat when they get to read him, but the shame is that a lot of people read The Law, which is a great little classic, and they're familiar with the analysis in what is seen and what is not seen. But I bet most people don't realize that you could fill potentially six volumes with the work of Frederick Bastia. You would know very well, wouldn't you? I certainly do, yes. Um, I've counted on my word processing file over a million words that he wrote in a very short space of time, which is quite remarkable. When I first discovered Bastiat, um, I was a teenager growing up in the suburbs of Sydney in Australia, and I'd come across uh, the writings of Ayn Rand and Murray Rothbard, read Mises, and of course, then I read Bastiat. I remember buying his books from Laissez-faire Books, and I read, you know, the fee editions, and which is less than half of what he wrote in his lifetime. And I read him and I thought he was a very clever and funny um, journalist, but that's all. I, I sort of took the Hayek line that he was just a good journalist and uh, n nothing much of a theorist until um, Liberty Fund's project of, uh, to translate his entire works um, came across my path. And um, I read or reread um, Bastia in the original, all one million words. And I thought, my God, this man is much, much more than a journalist. Right. Now, I, I think my friend Mark Thornton came to that uh, position as well, that we think of him as having been a very skilled popularizer. And nothing wrong with that. That's a wonderful service that we need. But when he was, in fact, much more than that, he deserves the full credit. Now, as you've gone through and read all this material, would you what would you say are the lost works of Bastiat that it's the biggest shame people don't know about? I think that the way he was able to combine at least three or four sets of activities. Um, he wasn't just a journalist and a popularizer. Uh, he went to Paris quite late in life. He was 44, and he discovered Richard Cobden and the Cornwall League's activities in England, and he was passionate about setting up a, f a free trade movement in France. And he started writing to Cobden and wrote a wonderful book about uh, Cobden and the strategy that the Anti-Cornwall League was using um, to bring about free trade in England. That was his first book, and that's never been translated. And the first 100 pages of that book written by Bastia is his strategizing about how to change um, France from a highly protectionist country into a free trade country. So that's interesting. He's a, he's a strategic thinker. Um, he then goes to Paris and is this, uh, tr sets up the, the free trade movement. So he's an agitator. He's a public speaker. He, he, he um, goes to meetings. Uh, he lobbies the parliament. So he's, a, he's, a, he's an activist. That's sort of like one of his... Uh, lesser known activities. Um, the revolution of 1848 breaks out in February and uh, the, he then becomes a politician and he gets elected from uh, to represent his, uh, the region of France he comes from, which is the southwest part, uh, Gascony, um, and he becomes a very successful uh, politician. He, he is the vice president of the finance committee of the chamber. 
So I've come across a number of his speeches in the parliament, which have never been translated before, and uh, they're hard hitting and very interesting. Uh, then his uh, a third sort of activity was during the revolution, he was actually on the streets of Paris handing out a little revolutionary magazine, urging the working class uh, to not to be seduced by socialism. And he, he gets caught up in the crossfire between the troops who are suppressing the, the, the rioters and the rioters. So he's a sort of street fighting economist, <laughs> which is, I, I'd never come across that before. And then um, he's also... Uh, writing this whole series of anti-socialist pamphlets during 1848-49. I've counted about 12, and not all of them have been translated. Um, and they're wonderful attacks on every aspect of socialism you could imagine. And then uh, he, sort of the final part of his life is um, as a theorist. He's, you know, wh while he's doing all these things, being constantly distracted by politics and revolution and so on, he's trying to write his um, treatise on economics, and he has... I would describe him as a proto-Austrian or perhaps also a proto-public choice theorist. And the tragedy, of course, he never finishes that project and dies a very painful death. Far too young. Indeed, yeah. I think his dates are just from memory. Is it 1801 to 1850? Yeah, he's 49. And um, it's interesting that he – I'm trying to figure out why he left his quiet backwater in the southwest of France at the age of 44 to start a whole new career. He was quite well off. He was a landowner. Uh, he earned enough money to you know, in ta to pay taxes that it would allow him to uh, to vote. It was only about two percent of the population earned enough money to vote uh, before 1848. So I don't know why he left um, that very comfortable life. Uh, it must have been a passion of some kind. You know, he wanted to bring free trade to France. But anyway, he, he pulls up his roots and moves to Paris um, at this relatively advanced age. I mean, most people didn't live to be 50, and has a whole new career. I think also possibly he, he knew he was dying. He had a throat condition, which I think was uh, throat cancer, not tuberculosis, which is the common uh, explanation for his death. And I think oh. he knew that if he didn't do something, he, I think he knew he had a book in his head that he could write. And if he didn't do something to get out of his little backwater, it would never get written. Now, Liberty Fund has done collected works of a lot of people and indeed people who – died not even all that long ago. But in that case, it's it's a matter of collecting them, organizing them, introducing them, and publishing. But here, it's also a massive translation project. So are you going to be bringing into the English-speaking world a lot of material we've never read before in English? Is that the idea? Oh, yes, at least um, twice what Fee had um, translated. Uh, for example, volume one of our collection is his correspondence. So, so that's never been translated before. And that's fascinating because it shows us the personal side of Bastia. And, and I called, in my talk, I said he was the, the unseen radical. And it's in his correspondence where a lot of that comes out. Um, just to step back a little bit, um, he had a, um, a, a curiosity that was almost insatiable. When he was uh, a young man, he inherited property from his grandfather. Um, and he was only 25. And um, he and some neighbors set up a, a sort of like a book club or a discussion group. And... Uh, they met on a regular basis, and you know he he we know that from his letters that he was reading economics and and, and social theory, and was a, a supporter of free trade. But what I didn't know until I read his correspondence carefully was that he read practically everything that had been written in economics in four different languages. He spoke obviously French, um, but he spoke English, Italian, and Spanish. And so he was uh, sitting in his, his little backwater for 20 years reading nothing but economics. So when he comes to Paris at the age of 44, 45, it's ready to come pouring out. It's quite remarkable. That is – but you've given us so much to talk about here. I hardly know where to begin. When you said that he was trying to persuade the working class that it would be wrong to let themselves be seduced by socialism, I'm curious about some of the – arguments he would make to them, because that's an argument a lot of people find it hard to make, because the socialists sound like they're making an argument for the working class. It, uh, superficially, that's exactly what they're doing. How do you counter that, and how did he counter that? Well, the, um, the famous essay that he wrote um, at the time was um, The State, and the interesting thing was that that pamphlet that we know and love um, was uh, originally written as, one of, as, a, as a short article in one of his um, revolutionary street magazines. Um, he, he started two during the revolution, one in February, which was a daily, and he and Molinari and a few other friends um, 
published this and handed it out on the streets of Paris. And they also made posters, uh, which they would stick up all over the walls because censorship had collapsed. And so there was complete freedom of speech. And so all the socialists and all the radical groups and the Democrats and the Republicans and the liberals like um, Molinari and Bastia were just uh, sticking up posters all over the town, handing out uh, you know, leaflets on the streets and everything like that. He had a second one in um, June, um, which was called Jacques Bonhomme, after one of his favorite um, sort of fictional characters. And it's in Jacques Bonhomme that he writes an early draft of the state, uh, which you can find in volume two of our collection. It's called uh, a draft. And he, what he does is he lists all the things that the, the people are wanting the government to do for them. And he said, how is the government going to pay for this? It's going to tax you. It's going to regulate your life. It's going to take away economic opportunities. You're the ones who are going to pay for this. And eventually, um, you know, he comes up with his famous bet, you know, that he'll give 40,000 francs to whoever comes up with a, a good definition of the state. Um, which he does in the um, extended version of this essay, which becomes the essay that we know as the state, where he says the, the state is the great fiction where everyone tries to live at the expense of everyone else. But his basic argument was that uh, what you're asking the government to do is, is going to um, reduce economic opportunity, which will hurt you in the long run, and you will then end up paying um, most of the taxes because they don't have an income tax. It's all indirect taxes. And he says it's the it's the tax on salt, it's the tax on meat, it's the tax on bread, it's the tax on wine, it's the tax on sending letters through the mail. He said, it's the working class who pay all these taxes. And he said, that's why you're being exploited. I'm also intrigued by Bastiat as a strategist, because that's also something that we struggle with today. We feel like we have a really compelling worldview, and we feel like we've got the right way to think about the economy, and yet it seems like we're a million miles from where we want to be, and it seems as if we would need a, an extremely educated populace even to have any hope of having any making any progress. So what did he think about this, about what we should be doing, or at least what France should be doing? Well, he was inspired by the um, Anti-Corn Law League in England, and they had adopted some of the first examples of modern um, lobbying and uh, popular protest it's ever occurred. Things like um, mass meetings, uh, collecting tens of thousands of signatures and dumping them on the steps of parliament to put pressure on politicians, uh, having um, public talks across the country and selling merchandise. I mean, I, I had no idea this, that Cobden did this. You could buy um, all sorts of merchandise like uh, envelopes and letters and plates and, and uh, little bust figures of Cobden, uh, which they used to raise money. And uh, Bastia reads all about all this and says, my God, we, can, we should do the same in, in, in France. So it was partly a much more sophisticated um, use of the technology of cheap printing. Um, you know, they were cutting, in England, they were cutting the cost of sending uh, letters. You know, to the, you know, the penny stamp was, um, had just come in in the late 1830s, early 1840s, and the Cornwall League uh, is an early adopter of this to send out their propaganda cheaply all across um, um, England. And Bastiat wanted to do exactly the same thing in France. And so he was one of the, the great lobbyists for cutting the cost of, you know, the, obviously sending letters in France was a monopoly. And um, the government also taxed it at a very high rate. And he wanted, um, A, to smash the, um, the French monopoly on the sending of letters, um, but also to drastically cut the tax uh, so that it, it, propaganda could be sent cheaply throughout the country. Uh, he also was in, really impressed with the way in which the anti Cornwall League used um, professional itinerant speakers to go all across the country giving lectures on free trade to uh, mass audiences. You know, um, and also the use of women. Uh, women played a very important part in the anti Cornwall League propaganda. I mean, they would be people manning the tables, or in this case, womaning the tables, uh, handing out the literature and selling the merchandise. And he, he wanted, and Bastiat wanted the stodgy French to get over their. Um, conventional attitudes about women um, in politics and to make use of uh, some of the uh, women supporters of free trade ideas. Well, let me ask you about some of his ideas. I've, I've, I've devoted an episode to the ideas of Basiat myself, but I want to ask about, in particular in the law, his concept of legal plunder. And he, here, it's, it's actually a very radical idea because he's saying that in our private lives, we all more or less understand there are certain standards of behavior we all have to abide by, and that includes 
keep your hands to yourself, whether it's physical force or looting somebody. But then when it, beca- when it turns to the government, we say, well, that's legitimate because for some reason it becomes legitimate because the government is doing it. But if that's his argument, how can he justify any taxation at all? And, and since, I don't, since he was not an outright anarchist, he must have favored some level of taxation. Yeah, he did. And I think um, Molinari pointed out this contradiction to him. So it was, he knew Really? It. Really? So I didn't even know they knew each other. Well, they were contemporaries. I mean, Molinari was 20 years younger than Bastiat, but they um, were both in Paris at the same time. Molinari was a young journalist uh, when Bastiat arrived, um, and they became very close friends. Um, And so when the revolution breaks out uh, in February, Molinari goes to Bastiat and says, we've got to do something. Let's start a a magazine and hand it out on the streets. And uh, the two of them collaborated both in February and then again in June, starting two different little magazines. And, and they were out there in the streets together. Um, so they were very close. Um, and Molinari has some very interesting things to say about Bastiat in his obituary, um, which he wrote just after, you know, in 1851, uh, which we can talk about later. Um, but, you know, to go back to this idea of plunder, um, Bastia um, had been developing this idea for a few years before um, the law appeared, uh, sort of 1847, 46 perhaps, when he starts writing what would become his economic sophisms. He says, we've got to use the right language to describe what the government's doing to us. And he says, um, we have to use harsh and, and, and plain language. And what the government is doing, it's stealing from us. And so he came up with all these different words to describe what the government did, like um, filching, plundering, stealing. Um, and he came up with this idea of extra legal plunder, which is what common criminals do, the highwayman does. You know, we all think it's bad. But he said, well, what the government does is legal plunder. And he says, we've got to be very clear um, and we have to use these, these words. But it's only plunder if the government doesn't provide you with a service in return for what it takes. Um, so that's where he gets over that um, anarchist problem, you know, that not everything the government does is bad because it sometimes does provide a useful service in his view, like providing police and defence uh, uh, services. But Bastiat's idea of the ideal tax was his, uh, his ideal tax was a flat and very low income tax on every um, everybody. Um, before they could move, to, he, before you could move to that, he says we, we we have a system which is heavily weighted in favour of indirect taxes and tariffs. He wanted to abolish indirect taxes on, on food, for example, uh, salt, alcohol, um, and replace that with a 5% um, tariff. He, he thought a 5% tariff was um, a revenue tariff. Anything more than 5% was a protectionist tariff, and he wanted to reduce all tariffs to uh, no more than 5%. So, he, you know, he did see uh, – but he, he wanted um, – I call him an ultra-minimalist because it, the, what, the things he wanted the government to do were extremely limited – um, one of my um, one of his most radical uh, economic sophisms is called the Utopian, which he wrote in early 1847, and it's a fantasy of um, the king comes to a politician, which is obviously Bastia, and says, "I'm giving you dictatorial powers to change France in whatever direction you want," and this Utopian politician starts dreaming about how many um, government departments he would ab- abolish, how many taxes he would cut. And he goes uh, on and on with this great list of slashing, um, you know, the government right down to the bone. You know, as I think about it, uh, I, I just realize now, I think it may be a bit inside baseball for me to be, for actually both of us talk about Molinari, because not everybody has heard of Molinari. Can you take a minute to, to tell people who Gustave de Molinari was, what his significance was? Well, Gustave de Molinari, um, like Bastia, came from the provinces um, to Paris to make fame and fortune. And um, he's one of a group of half a dozen or so young people like uh, like that who were, uh, came to Paris with radical, radical new ideas about how the economy should work. Um, a French historian by the name of Gérard Minard calls them the four musketeers of French political economy. But I think, in fact, there are seven. And I'll just um, – just Molinari and Bastia and another guy called Coquelin are particularly interesting because – and I think there's a sociological phenomenon here. These are outsiders coming to Paris. They don't have family there. They don't have um, a network of friends. And they just think differently. And Coquelin, for example, was an advocate of free banking, very radical free banking, wanted to um, smash the um, 
monopoly central bank and to have private uh, banks issuing competitively uh, their own currencies. Molinari is a young man who comes and wants to privatize everything. Um, he writes a book in 1849, which Liberty Fund, I'm translating and editing, in which Liberty Fund will publish called Les Soirées de la Rue Saint-Lazare, Evenings on St. Lazarus Street, which is, Molinari writes in 1849, so during the revolutionary period. And every chapter of that book is an explanation of how um, public goods could be provided um, competitively on the free market. And soiree number 11 um, is the famous one where he talks about the private provision of police and defence services by insurance companies. And this has a, a profound impact on Rothbard when Rothbard is reading Molinari in the 1950s and 60s and uh, obviously builds upon that. And then you have Bastiat, who's um, from the southwest of France. Uh, Coquelin comes from the north of France. Uh, Molinari comes from Liège in what would become Belgium. Bastiat comes from Gascony. And Bastiat has um, these radical notions about plunder and the state and, um, I would say, subjective value theory. So he's an early Austrian. So these three guys are all working together um, in Paris. Uh, there's an, a, another guy, uh, Guillaume, who's, a, who's the, an older man who's the publisher. and He's, he's a bit like um, the Liberty Fund. His publishing firm um, publishes all the books that these uh, economists are producing. He prints their journals and uh, he arranges financing for all their activities. Uh, uh, so he, he, he's, he's a very important figure. But, you know, come, these guys all come together and are working together in the 1840s and uh, are involved in the revolution and then this uh, quite remarkable group of people, you know, I call them the Seven Musketeers, um, one guy um, dies in the cholera epidemic of 1849. Um, Bastiard dies from throat cancer in 1850. Cochrane dies from a heart attack in 1852. Gustave de Molinari decides to leave Paris because he refuses to live under Napoleon and moves to Brussels. It goes into kind of voluntary exile. So this extraordinary group of radical libertarians is dispersed and broken up, uh, which sets back the French classical liberal movement by um, many, many years. So it's an exciting time. If I could ever get control of a Doctor Who episode, I'd take the TARDIS back to Paris in 1848 so I could meet some of these guys. Well, as a matter of fact, you did write a screenplay about the life of Bastia. What does that look like? Oh, it's um, languishing here on my desk, actually. It's, um, I was um, phoned up about by a, a guy who said he was a film producer from Florida about two and a half years ago. And he said, can you write a screenplay about uh, the life of Bastiat? He says, I think it would be really interesting. And I said, well, I don't know anything about writing screenplays. And he said, well, that's okay. Most of the people who give me screenplays don't know how to write screenplays either. <laughs> yeah. So I, t I took two years to write it, and it was a wonderful, interesting experience. I, I'm not sure it's going to go anywhere. I think it's an unfilmable film because it's in the middle of a revolution and it's full of ideas and um, – Films about ideas don't do very well. Anyway, so um, what it made me do was to go back and read Bastiat's correspondence um, with a, a different set of spectacles. I'd read it as a historian of ideas, but now I was reading it as uh, someone who wanted to write a story. So I was looking for drama, for personal details, um, for possible conflicts or romantic interests or whatever, whatever might make a good movie. Uh, and that was a wonderful experience. Um, we don't know, know anything about his love life, but um, it was interesting to speculate about possible flirtations, um, which uh, is in the movie, or my script anyway. I think he has a flirtation with one of the wives of a wealthy of the wealthy benefactors who helped um, subsidise the, the liberal movement in Paris at the time. Um, one of them was a, um, a wealthy manufacturer, and his wife, uh, Hortense, which is a great name for a French uh, lover, um, ran a salon in Paris, and Bastiat used to go to that um, salon, we know from the correspondence, and he was one of the stars. I mean, this is another radical side of Bastiat. Uh, Hortense uh, runs this um, swanky uh, salon where all the rich and famous and, you know, the political elite attend, and Bastiat is regaling them with stories. He has a prodigious memory for um, poetry and drama. He used to recite poetry and uh, uh, scenes from Moliere um, you know, during the, the soirees, um, and uh, he would sing songs. He was very interested in political songs and would sing songs that were banned or, or a bit bawdy um, and, and shock the guests. Uh, 
he was a very keen cello player and he would quite often just start playing the cello and singing, much to the amusement of the people attending the, the salons. So he, he was very interesting. Anyway, so I invented a kind of uh, flirtatious uh, affair between him and Hortense. Hortense is interesting because she, uh, when Bastiat was um, being constantly distracted from finishing um, the economic harmonies, uh, Hortense and her husband arranged for Bastiat to have the use of a hunting lodge in a forest just outside of Paris. Uh, it still exists today. And it's a sort of historic um, site. Anyway, Bast they arranged for Bastiat to spend the summer of 1849 in this lodge so he could have be secluded and, and no distractions. And he wrote most of the first volume of Economic Harmonies in this Boutard hunting lodge in Paris uh, because of uh, the intervention of Hortense uh, Chevreux, uh, which I thought was fascinating. Um, and then um, after Bastiat's death, um, she like 28 years after his death, um, she publishes a book of his letters to her. So I think there is there was possibly some romantic attachment between the two. You know, why would you do that? So we include those letters in our volume one, which is, I think, also very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Now, sw switching gears for a minute, what can you tell us about Bastiat as a theorist as opposed to just a popularizer? Yes, well, that was the one of the biggest... Um, revelations to me when I uh, looked at Bastiat more closely. See, so much is going on um, with his political activity, you know, the free trade movement and in, as an elected politician and all this, uh, you know, journalism and so on, um, that he's constantly being distracted. And uh, But what you do, what you can do is you can see um, sort of elements of, of original thinking. And I have a list of them I could go through um, if you're interested. But um, I kept, as I read all this stuff, I kept thinking, oh, that's a very interesting insight. It was just sort of like a throwaway line where he'd be talking something about subjective value theory. And um, this kept happening so many times. I said, well, this can't be an accident. If it happened once or twice, he's just lucky, you know, he, he stumbles across an idea. But it kept happening again and again and again. And so I began compiling a list of some of the ideas that uh, original ideas that he was coming up with, and it's very impressive, and they keep recurring. So I know, um, I know he um, he thought deeply about this. I have a in volume four, which is I've just handed um, the, the final draft of the manuscript to our in-house editor. There is an essay that he wrote in early 1845. He writes a letter to the um, the poet uh, and, and politician Lamartine. Um, where Lamartine um, seems to be advocating one of the, a socialist idea about um, you know workers have a right to a job, and Bastia attacks him, which is quite a courageous thing to do because Lamartine was sort of considered to be a liberal hero at the time, and in this essay, which will be in our volume four, he comes up with about a dozen of these key original insights, all in the one essay. So it's my view that these ideas were in his head before he came to Paris. Right. He'd been thinking about them for 20 years, um, and it, as I said before, it all came pouring out. Um, let me just give you a – I'll see if I can find my list here. I had it I had it earlier. Just some of the insights that just are scattered in so many of his writings, but when you put them all together, it's very impressive. And, of course, that's what he was trying to do in, in writing the Economic Harmonies, but could never, he just couldn't finish it. I mean, one of the most important things is the idea of opportunity cost, you know, the whole thing about the seen and the unseen. Tony de Jasse uh, thinks that Bastiat invented that and it's, it's, it's one of his greatest claims to fame. I came across his use of the term ceteris paribus, all things being equal, other things being equal. Um, he uses that m many, many times in his writings and most economic historians think that John Stuart Mill was the first person to use it um, consistently in the early 1840s, but here's Bastiat in the mid-1840s, um, not apparently having read John Stuart Mill, but using um, the same idea. Another uh, important innovative idea, I think, was um, sort of like a reverse Keynesian notion of the mul multiplier effect. Uh, you might call it a sort of divider effect, um, whereas the Keynesians think that if go government expenditure has a multiplying effect of goodness, you know, benefits to the economy, Bastiat came up with this idea that when governments intervene with a tariff or a subsidy or something, there's a multiplying effect, but it's all negative. It causes increasing negative ripples to go through the economy to the disadvantage of, 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 of so many ordinary consumers. So they're just a few uh, ideas that I think are very important um, 
And they're just general economic ideas, nothing um, particularly Austrian or public choice about them. And then there's a whole list of, I think, Austrian insights that he comes up with. Uh, the most well-known, I think, is the one about subjective value theory. He's a very um, precocious early um, advocate of this notion. But what, again, something that I hadn't realized until I went into in, in more detail was I think he is an early Austrian because of his understanding in a fairly abstract uh, way of the theory of human action. He uses the term human action or individuals as actors uh, or acting individuals repeatedly in his writings. Um, and you can see this in some of his economic sophisms with, when he starts using the idea of, of Robinson Crusoe about the economic choices that uh, Robinson Crusoe faces just you know, to feed himself, you know, or, or how does he make a, a hook so he can improve the productivity of his fishing? So he's got to put aside some uh, savings in the form of food so he can devote time to making a, a hook to improve his productivity as a fisherman. And I think he invented Crusoe economics, this way of trying to abstract the sort of economic choices that people face um, even just one person on a, on, a, on a desert island. And when I was looking at Rothbard's uh, Man, Economy and State again recently, I was looking, if you look at the first three chapters where he's talking about exchange, he uses as a foundation stone for his own understanding of Austrian theory of human action, um, Robinson Crusoe stories. If you look in the footnotes, where does Rothbard get this idea from? They're all from Bastia. So, I mean, I think um, Rothbard saw very early how radically Austrian Bastia was. Um, and I, I could go through a, a, another list of, of, of things here, like his idea of a spontaneous order, um, the role of entrepreneurs, how individuals evaluate and judge things in a very unique and personal way, his, knowledge, his idea, uh, understanding of the knowledge problem of, of central planning. Um, how do you feed a city of the size of Paris? How can a central planner do that? Um, the interdependence or interconnectedness of all economic activity. He has an early version of Leonard Reed's I Pencil story. Um, he, ha he talks about a carpenter, a simple village carpenter, and, and how that carpenter um, uses things from all over the world that he had no, um, uh, he didn't create himself. And then there are public choice insights, uh, self-interest of bureaucrats and politicians, um, the whole notion of rent seeking, um, and I could it could go on and on. But I think you know that they're just a, a sampling of, of some of the important ideas that Bastiat had that he's not recognized uh, for. What can you tell me about the circumstances of Bastiat's death? And then I'm also interested in Molinari's obituary for him, which I've never seen before. Well, that's because it hasn't been translated. Um, it's oh, English. okay. That would explain it. it. That would explain it, yeah. See, Mo Molinari uh, was a very long-lived um, person. He, he was born in 1819, so 18 years after Bastiat, but he died in 1912. So he was in his 90s, and he lived long enough to see practically every important 19th century French classical liberal die, and he wrote their obituaries just because he lived longer than anyone else, um, which is rather sad. But um, everyone thought that Bastiat must have died of tuberculosis because he, he complains about coughing um, in his correspondence. But when you read more carefully, um, he also complains about a lump in his throat and how he couldn't swallow and that suggested to me um, cancer of some kind. And we know it was extremely painful and he, it, it took him several years of, to die, um, often in extremely difficult, painful circumstances. Um, so that, that's one of the things that I've learned to admire about Bastiat is how the, the courage he had in the face of death. You know, he just kept working and working and working, writing books and pamphlets and doing his research, uh, even though he knew he was dying. Which, which is, uh, I think, uh, admirable. I'm not sure how I would uh, cope if I knew I was dying and doing so in such a painful way. Um, yeah. So the last year of his life, you know, when, he, when he writes um, The Law and uh, What is Seen and What is Not Seen, two of his most famous works, he does that over the summer of 1850 when he only had months to live and he would have been in excruciating pain. It's quite extraordinary. Yeah, it is. It is. Because What is Seen and What is Not Seen is regarded as one of his greatest works and uh, – uh, I read in the the French original French editor's uh, comment about how what is seen and what is not seen was produced. He said Bastiat uh, wrote the th what we have is his third version of it. 
He wrote it once and then lost it in a move. He wrote it a second time from memory and wasn't happy with it and threw it in the fire and then wrote it a third time. It was quite, I mean, while he was dying of you know, throat cancer. Wow. Wow. Jeez, he was, he was a dedicated man. Dedicated man, yes. But, you know, I think perhaps dedicated sometimes with too many things on his plate. I just wish he'd spent more time working on economic harmonies and getting that into good shape because I think that was meant to be the first part of a three or four volume work on social theory. And had he, I've tried to reconstruct that. And I, if you look, go to the, an essay I've written about this on the online library of Liberty website. Uh, if you just key into your um, favorite search engine, OLL, which stands for online library of Liberty, OLL Bastia project, you'll get the, the page where all this stuff is listed. But I think he wanted to, st- he's originally called the book Social Harmonies. He wanted to write a book about how humans can organize all aspects of their life, you know, social, legal, religious, personal, economic, in a harmonious way in which they can all pretty much pursue their own ends and, and have those ends satisfied without causing too much harm to each other. And then he realized that was too big a project and that he really should concentrate on the economics, just one aspect of a much broader picture. And then I think he also had in mind uh, another book he was going to write on disharmonies. And this was to be a history of plunder about how both private individuals, but more importantly in his time, organized states could um, disrupt and destroy the harmony of society, the harmony of the of the economy um, through plunderous policies like taxation and intervention and uh, tariffs and subsidies and so on. And uh, he sketches some of this out in the first two chapters of the second series of the economic harmonies, the physiology of plunder, where he goes into sort of in very sketchy way, um, sort of a historical process whereby plunder changes over time. So I think he probably had, you know, three books that he was planning to, to, to write and then only had time to finish the first half of his economic harmonies. When he died, he left all his papers. Um, uh, the first edition of economic harmonies came out with only 10 chapters and then the, the, the version that we know today was completed by his friends and published in 1851, and that has 25 chapters, but most of that are just um, sketches and drafts cobbled together. We don't know how what Bastia's final thoughts on some of these matters were. Uh, it's such a shame. It just uh, just goes to show what an amazing guy he was. As I said before, I said uh, I kept telling myself, uh, I wish he would stop writing all these damn pamphlets and just yeah. <laughs> go back to work yeah. on his book on theory. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, so, so I'm. Uh, Again, I did not know about the connection with Molinari. I, I I know about what people thought, but I don't know anything about who knew whom and who was writing to whom and who was working with whom. I know none of that stuff. So it's interesting that Molinari wrote this uh, obituary for Basiat. And and uh, is is he cherishing him as a friend? Is he putting him in in intellectual context? What's his goal in that? Well, it's interesting because um, amongst the political economists in Paris at the time. Um, Bastia and Molinari were the most radical and innovative thinkers, but they didn't agree with each other. They were radical and different in different ways. And um, neither of them really appreciated how radical and innovative the other was, but they were good friends. And they were, I mean, personally and sort of socially, they were radicals as well as radical thinkers. Um, anyway, so Molinari didn't really approve of Bastia's ideas about subjective value theory. He thought that was going too far. Bastia was a, an ardent critic of Malthus, thinking that he said that Malthus just doesn't understand how productive the economy could be, that we can grow enough food to feed, you know, however many people um, there are, that people a human capital, a human capital is good. The more people there are, you know, the better off economies will be, the better the division of labor, um, and so on and so on. Molinari was a staunch um, Malthusian, so he dis- disagreed with uh, Bastia on that. Bastia was, an, as I said, an ultra-minimalist uh, government um, supporter and didn't agree with um, Molinari's um, anarchism. So the two of them were sort of pushing the, the liberal movement in different directions but not agreeing with each other but being sort of close together because everyone else rejected them as well. So <laughs> sort of radical companions uh, right, sure. pushed together because they were, but didn't necessarily agree with each other. 
So um, Molinari's um, reminiscences of Bastia are very interesting because he talks about um, when he first met Bastia. Uh, Molinari was working as a journalist, and um, Molinari was um, he was covering a court case that was uh, underway where um, some carpenters who um, tried to start a trade union in Paris, and this, this was banned under French law, and these carpenters were being um, prosecuted. And Molinari was covering this court case for the magazine, and he was in favour of the right of um, workers to form trade unions, as was Bastia. He had a great speech in the chamber about the right of um, anyone to form a, an association, and a union was just a, a, one kind of a, an association. Anyway, so um, Bastia goes to the office of where Molinari is working to talk to him about um, a review that they had done of his book, which was very favourable. And Molinari talks about the first time that uh, Bastia walks into the office. And it's very funny um, because um, Bastia was a provincial um, landowner. Uh, he, he, he liked, he spoke a very, with a very heavy Gascon accent, which the Parisians thought was hilarious. You know, it's like a Texan going to Washington, D.C. or New York, you know, and Bastia wore a funny hat, you know, or country hat. He wore, he carried a big umbrella, which was not fashionable in Paris at the time. He wore a, a green woolen jacket, which no one wore, I mean, green in Paris. Everyone wore black um, and, and fashionable hats. He had a sort of um, poofy white shirt, you know, with cuffs on it, and everyone just thought that was crazy. Anyway, so um, Bastia, I mean, Molinari has this wonderful description about how weird Bastia looked and sounded when he walked into the office. And, and Bastia then starts talking about economics, and Molinari says, as soon as he started talking about economics, we stopped laughing. This man was sprouting diamonds. His, his nuggets of knowledge were like diamonds. And he says, um, from that moment on, we realized we were in the presence of a, a very deep thinker. Wow. And Molinari um, also tells us that Bastia refused to change his wardrobe, um, uh, the, the economist's said, oh, you, I can recommend this particular tailor. Go and get a decent jacket and, you know, a proper hat. And Bastia refused. He says, no, I like um, being a Gascon country gentleman. I'm going to keep wearing this, uh, this, uh, these clothes and I'm going to keep talking the way I, 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 I talk. You know, I'm not going to change my accent. Because he was very proud of being a, a southerner, which is, I thought, you know, quite touching and interesting. Yeah, yeah, indeed. He also had uh, Molinari comments about um, on Bastia's wit. He says um, – he had uh, sparkling eyes. He said, when, we, when you look into Bastia's eyes, you can see a genius there, but it's also a, a witty um, genius. He, he described Bastia's wit as being Rabelaisian. And if you know, um, you know Rabelais, the, the great um, French writer, was also very bawdy. And so I, this is a suggestion, I think, that Bastia had a, a particular kind of humour, um, perhaps a sort of uh, with a lot of sexual innuendo and other things, uh, which he's, you know, peppered his um, speech with, which is something that made him popular in the uh, salons that he attended uh, a couple of years later. So, I mean, these little interesting insights. Uh, but Bastia, uh, his originality wasn't fully appreciated by Molinari. So when, when Molinari sums up Bastia's life, he says he wasn't an original thinker like Jean-Baptiste Say, he says, but he was our Benjamin Franklin, that he saw Bastia's main contribution as being as a popularizer of economic ideas rather than an originator. So that, that's unfortunate about Molinari's assessment of Bastia. I think Molinari was wrong on that. Well, tell me how people can find out more about what Liberty Fund is doing in this project, they can, if you can link to it, to the progress you've made so far, and also your own personal website so they can find out about what you're doing in general. Sure. The, um, I run the uh, online library of Liberty, um, which is one of the projects uh, that Liberty Fund um, sponsors. So you can go to oll.libertyfund.org and um, in the top left-hand corner, there is a link to um, the Bastia project where the summary of um, what we're doing at the moment. It's a six-volume project. Um, volume three came out in March of this year. This volume three was the um, complete works of the, com the collected economic sophisms. Fee only translated two-thirds of them. Back in the 60s, there's another third series, which are um, just as interesting and amusing and clever as the other two. Volume four is his miscellaneous economic writings, and as I said, I've just finished the manuscript for that. Volume five is going to be, um, I hope, the definitive edition of Economic Harmonies, and that's sort of halfway done. 
Volume 6 is a collection of his writings um, for the French free trade movement, which he largely headed up and led. So that's that's the million words, uh, the six volumes. Wow. Okay, so we're going to make sure and link to this. Uh... As I said, yeah, that, that would be really helpful. I just, As I said, if you just um, keyword in your favorite search engine, OLL, Bastiat Project, you'll get that page come up. Okay, and it'll also be at tomwoods.com slash 956. We'll have that stuff linked there. Well, great project, very important, very interesting, too. I learned an awful lot about Bastiat from this conversation. So thanks so much, David. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, Tom. All right, everybody, that's it. Now, you know what's coming up in the next episode, 958. You know what that is. It's a progressive rock episode. In fact, I'm going to be talking to Dave Weigel of the Washington Post, who has a brand new book out on the subject. And man, is that going to be glorious. And if you don't listen, I'll know. No, I won't, but that was just fun to say that. All right, see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.